Hi, everyone. It's nice to be back. Uh, so by way of introduction, for those of you do, who do not know me or us, I am Brian Sylvester. I'm a special counsel at Covington and Burling in the Washington office. I previously worked at USDA uh, in the general counsel's office doing regulatory work. Um, at Covington, I practice in the area of food and drug law with an emphasis on food tech in particular. And hi, everyone. I'm Jessica O'Connell. I'm a partner at Covington. I'm also based in Washington, D.C. Um, like Brian, I'm in our regulatory group. Um, and I started my career at FDA. So you have uh, former FDA and USDA here, which isn't the, the, the same as current. But we'll, we'll do our best to try to give you some sense of where we think things are going. All right. Um, so today, we're going to give the long-awaited regulatory update. And um, we're going to start off um, by just, I like starting off with this slide just to give a sense of what people are saying all around the world in terms of headlines from like Forbes to CNBC to CNN. Like this is an issue that I've been tracking since 2018 as well. Um, and it's been remarkable to see the fascination that continues um, among the general like population. Um, there's some trepidation, but I think um, there's a lot of interest in a good way for the sector. Um, we're seeing a lot of startups uh, come on stream. Uh, this is not showing the way that it's supposed to show, but it's a map of the world from GFI. <laughs> <laughs> um, and these are the continents. <laughs> um, and so basically, we're just seeing uh, across all the different continents um, more and more companies in this space, which is great to see. And I think that's a testament to the fact that the regulatory framework is becoming clearer and clearer, not only in the United States, but in other parts of the world, gradually. So today we're going to start off, because I know a lot of uh, folks in the audience don't necessarily have a background in how this is regulated in the United States. So we're going to start off with a little brief overview of that. We'll talk about pre-market consultations with the FDA and USDA here in the US. We'll talk about labeling developments, naming conventions, some litigation, and global de developments um, that we think you should be aware of if you're not already. So uh, we're just going to spend just a very few minutes on, on the regulatory framework. I think most of you are just familiar already with the, with the breakdown of FDA versus USDA, but I think it does help set the stage for some of the more nuanced discussion we'll have on how um, these agencies are going to regulate this going forward. And so just taking a, a very big step kind of big picture, FDA has authority really over all food. And so FDA and, and it's statute gives it very broad authority. And then other agencies like USDA have certain areas of jurisdiction carved out where sometimes they share that jurisdiction with FDA, sometimes they don't. So interestingly, live animals that are intended for slaughter, both FDA and USDA have jurisdiction over those live animals. Um, the FDA defers to USDA, but the way the statute is written, they both have authority to regulate those. And so in, in kind of this space, you know, the, the typical breakdown that you hear is for meat 3% and for poultry, for, for raw meat 3% and for cooked meat 2%. And, and that gets it, you know, the pepperoni pizza, the chili with beef in it, the chicken noodle soup, things like that. And where, you know, there's enough meat in it, it falls under USDA jurisdiction. If there isn't, then it's solely regulated by FDA. Um, there are some kind of more detailed exemptions or carve outs for ingredients that are going to be used in products. And so if you're looking at just a fat ingredient, um, there's different thresholds there. And so I think if you're thinking about ingredients versus finished product and how they might be used, it's important to really understand where those lines are drawn and what agency would regulate them. The other thing I'll note is meat includes only certain meat. And so most game meat is only regulated by FDA and, and most seafood is regulated by FDA. And then these are the authorities that, that are relevant here. <laughs> um, so FDA has the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and that's really what gives it broad jurisdiction over food. Um, and then USDA kind of has these very specific points of jurisdiction. The other thing about the, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, and I think a lot of, of folks here, and that at least I've spoken to, is thinking about the components of food and really what does FDA have the authority to look at. And food is defined as food and anything that's reasonably expected to become a com component of food. And so if you're thinking about materials used in the processing of these products, whether FDA would care about them or regulate them or not, that's really the, the first step analysis is, is it something that's reasonably expected to become a component of the finished food? And if it is, that's when FDA is going to care about it more. 
Um, and this is some of what I just said, but this is really the starting point. And so when the agencies were thinking about how to approach this space and what to do, we're starting with these basic jurisdictional lines that have been drawn. And so USDA has mean meat food products and poultry and poultry products. I think the, the key difference that I want to, to point out here and that will come up later is USDA has pre-market authority to review product labels. Um, and improve product labels, whereas FDA doesn't. And so we're gonna talk about naming a lot today because I think that's a, an interesting topic and one that we're gonna see addressed a lot in the next year. And that hinges a lot on, on the agency's pre-market authority there. So USDA has that, FDA doesn't. The other kind of critical difference is USDA has the ability to be in facilities and oversee production, um, whereas FDA can come and inspect, but they're not kind of a permanent fixture there the way USDA is. All right, so turning to the formal agreement uh, that covers this sector, you now know that there's a USDA and the FDA. Within USDA, we have the Food Safety and Inspection Service. And so back in 2019, the two agencies came together. They uh, developed a formal agreement that shows and that, that states that the FDA will re uh, have regulatory oversight up until the point of harvest from the bioreactor. Um, and then post-harvest, if you are a, a food that is regulated by USDA, such as one of the amenable like meat products or poultry products, then USDA jurisdiction begins, and USDA then has the ability to and the authority to come into your facility during your processing, processing hours um, to monitor that you're complying with FSIS regulations, and also has oversight for labeling um, for your products. Um, and that's really important. This is focused on human food that's required to bear the mark of inspection. And so any of these facilities that are subject to USDA inspection will have to obtain a, a grant of inspection from FSIS. And that's what happens today for companies that have manufacturing plants that are processing different types of meat and poultry products. They have to obtain a grant of federal inspection from, from FSIS. And so that is like an example of how the existing framework applies to this novel technology. One area that is new, though, is just the entire process of um, understanding the safety profile that's unique to these products. Um, and so the USDA and the FDA are both getting educated through the consultations that we'll talk about in a second um, so that they can properly assess that the proper measures are being taken to ensure the products are safe and wholesome for their intended use. Um, one key update. Uh, is that there is a, a set of labeling requirements that are in process. There was an advanced notice of proposed rulemaking just over a year ago that was published in the Federal Register by the USDA. Um, there they asked a number of questions regarding the, the labeling, uh, how stakeholders feel it should be labeled, these products should be labeled, um, what level of detail in terms of qualifiers should be added, and we'll talk about that further in a, in a couple slides from now. Um, we wanted to note that this seems to be a long-term action, as noted on um, basically a, a website that tracks all the different rulemakings. And so we're not expecting to see a proposed rule um, from USDA in the short term, but it is in process and uh, we'll keep an eye on it. So turning to the regulatory considerations for companies in this space, um, we're going to start with the pre-market review process. So Right now, um, there is a consultation process that is available to stakeholders in this space for you to submit a pre-market safety um, notice. And that notice uh, should entail uh, elements such as the identity of the cells, tell us about the inputs, um, including the scaffolds and the media, for example, anything that might bioaccumulate, characterization of the cells at harvest, and then a food safety plan that includes uh, hazard analysis mapped out in the way you would for any kind of food production process, but tailored to this manufacturing process. So we're starting from a cell collection, uh, going through cell banking, uh, the proliferation, differentiation um, on through harvest. You need to map out at every level all of the potential hazards that could arise what the mitigating steps are, and so forth. And that has to be very detailed, and that, that's the kind of information that FDA would expect. Obviously, this is all very fact-specific, um, and so it's tailored to every company and their processes. Um, but at a high level, that's what FDA has been looking for. 
And we're expecting the FDA to publish draft guidance in the short term. Uh, they did have this draft guidance on their list to be published by December 31st. However, it's not yet uh, reached um, a review process at the White House. And so it seems unlikely that it would make that deadline. But we're going to keep our eyes uh, peeled to see if it does make it out before December 31st. Um, for any products that are subject to USDA oversight as well, then there is a, a review process that you have to engage with, with the USDA. USDA's F team at FSIS is very open and willing to meet with stakeholders uh, concurrently as they go through their process with the FDA. Um, and so they are also leveraging their authorities, their existing authorities under the statutes that Jessica mentioned, which are the Poultry Products Inspection Act and the Federal Meat Inspection Act. So in, in addition to pre-market review, we also have to think about the manufacturing process that you're going to be implementing, especially as you're developing your pilot plants and so forth. And so there, again, we look to the existing authorities that FDA and USDA have on the books. For FDA, that would be based on the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. Under that act, um, you have the um, hazard analysis and risk-based preventive controls and the current good manufacturing practices that are required and have to be applied in a tailored way to your manufacturing process. There's also USDA that has HACCP, which is a similar idea in terms of uh, confirming that you've uh, uh, that, that, that you've looked at all the hazards and that you've implemented mitigating steps for each hazard and you've mapped that out to the satisfaction of the criteria in the FSIS regulations. Then we have labeling, which we will talk about in further detail in a bit. Does the product qualify as a meat or poultry product as those terms are defined in the statute or regulation? Um, is there adequate substantiation for any claims you wish to make for your products? Um, and are there any new rules or guidance on the horizon? We know that there will be new rules from USDA. We also know that the FDA did a request for information um, a while back, and that FDA and USDA do plan to align on principles when it comes to labeling for these products, uh, regardless of whether they're regulated by the FDA or USDA ultimately. And then there's facility inspection, which I mentioned earlier. And so for any USDA uh, facility, you have to have that grants of inspection. USDA will be in your site if you're in the United States and you're processing cultivated meat or poultry products. Um, FDA also will be coming to take a look, um, but they won't be coming in on the steady clip that USDA comes because USDA is required to be in your facility once per shift. Um, when you're producing a food that's subject to USDA oversight. So I think now we're going to talk a bit about naming, which I think is, is an interesting topic and what we've seen some developments in even in the, in the past few months. And so just to kind of level set, there's no preset nomenclature for, for any of these products so far in the U.S. And so there hasn't been any federal kind of proclamation on, on how products should be named. There's a basic naming convention under both um, USDA's authorities and FDA's authorities, where a product is named with something called a statement of identity. And so if you have you know, Brian's water says Alpine spring water, that's the statement of identity and it's on the front label of the product. And so every food product has to have a statement of identity. And certain of those statement of identities are prescribed by regulation. And so we'll have an example in a minute of a product where the statement of identity, identity has been defined. In other cases, that ha that's not the case. And so then it's up to the marketer of the product to determine what the appropriate statement of identity is. Um, and, and typically, it's something called the common or usual name. Um, and so kind of the, the threshold question here is what is the appropriate statement of identity for products, cultured meat products, and, and other products made through alternative processes. And so um, both agencies have been thinking about that. This, the kind of the thought process started in part with a petition to USDA in 2018 from the Cattlemen's Association that focused um, on alternative meat products made through a number of different methods. And so what they asked USDA to do was say that beef um, is only meat that's produced from cattle born, raised, and harvested in the, quote, traditional manner. 
Um, and, and they asked that, that, you know, that use of that term be limited to just that. They also focused on meat in other terms. This petition got a lot of attention. 6,000 comments is a lot of comments, especially in a short period of time. Um, and most of the comments opposed the petition and said there's a way that you can use the words meat and beef that aren't confusing to consumers and should be allowed to be used. And so that those words can't be reserved solely for meat from a slaughtered animal. Um, and so USDA denied that petition. And so September 2021, the end of last year, they said, we don't, we're not going to do this right now. We don't think we have the authority to do this. We're going to address cultured meat product naming separately. And then to the extent that, that you know, the petition was asking us, USDA, to address plant-based products, we don't have the authority to do that because we don't regulate plant-based products. And so that was a, a thoughtful result from USDA, and, and that's where they said they were going to undertake additional rulemaking to deal with naming. USDA, as I mentioned, has a number of standards of identity for various meat and poultry products. And so this is just an example of the standard of identity that's in USDA's regulations for a hamburger. I'm not going to read it. It's lengthy, but what you'll see is it really focuses on beef, the beef components, um, and then the other ingredients that are added to the, the beef the beef cheek meat that can be used as well. Um, and so the question really here is, if this is a, a standard of identity that's on the books, this means that a hamburger that's sold should meet this standard of identity, should meet this definition. What does beef mean within the definition? And does beef mean just beef from a slaughtered cow, or does it mean beef that's produced through other processes? And these are the kinds of issues that USDA and FDA are going to have to grapple with, I think, for quite a number of years. Even once there's a convention established, there will be a number of regulations that have only contemplated kind of traditional processing um, to, to produce meat and poultry. Um, as Brian mentioned, following that petition, USDA put out um, an ANPRM, which is the first step in rulemaking. So it's something that comes before a proposed rule where they ask for public input on naming conventions. FDA put out a similar document called a request for information on labeling of cultured seafood. And so USDA has indicated they're going to undertake rulemaking to, to establish naming conventions. Um, FDA has indicated they might do that through guidance for products that they have where they regulate the finished product labeling. Um, and these are just some questions that USDA asked in that ANPRM. Um, and so just focused on, is there a term, a single term that should be used? Is qualifying, is using a qualifying term sufficient to inform consumers of what that product is? Um, should USDA establish standards of identity like the hamburger one that, that we just noted? Um, and should, you know, is there anything else that the agency needs to do? And so really the question that regulators are grappling with is what's necessary so that consumers understand what they're eating, right? And, and is a qualifying term necessary? And if so, what should that qualifying term be? Um, we've seen a lot of attention on these issues at the state level. And so some of you may be familiar with the various laws that have passed in different states um, related to the naming of, I'll say broadly alternative protein products, because they haven't just focused on one specific sector. At last count, I think 35 states had considered or passed laws in this space. So there's quite a number of states that have done so. I usually like to think of them as kind of in a few different buckets. And so the first bucket is the Missouri example that I give here. And Missouri was the first state to pass a law um, on kind of naming of alternative proteins. And there you'll see the law itself says, you can't misrepresent a product as meat that's not derived from harvested production, livestock, or poultry. And so there's some ambiguity in that from a legal perspective. It's saying you can't misrepresent. You can never misrepresent. <laughs> You're not allowed to misrepresent on a label. So really that's not doing a whole lot. But once the law was passed, there was a lot of outcry about it, in part because some of the penalties were criminal penalties, and so there was risk of being put in jail if you violated the law, and some of the language was written to apply to retailers. And so because of that, um, a number of companies challenged the law, some kind of more passively, and then some through litigation as well. Um, through some of the more passive engagement with the state, Missouri put out a guidance that effectively said, if there's an appropriate qualifier, we don't think there's a misrepresentation. And so at the time, their focus was really on the plant-based space because that's what was on the market then. And so they, they authorized expressly a plant-based qualifier. But that guidance is, is broader as well. And so the, the bucket of you know, Missouri follow-on laws are those that I think prohibit misrepresentation but also reasonably allow the use of a qualifier and also leave open what that qualifier might be. And, and there's a number of states that have passed laws like that. 
There's also a number of states that have passed much more restrictive laws. And so Arkansas is an example of where it just prohibited, and in some of the languages here, but it broadly prohibited use of, of meat terms on products that are not from a slaughtered animal. Um, they were also sued, and just a couple of weeks ago, a federal court granted an injunction in that case. And so what that means is that Arkansas is prohibited from enforcing that law. Um, most of these cases are litigated primarily under the First Amendment, so the general argument is the government can't prevent or prohibit speech that's, tr that's truthful and not misleading, and so that's really the, the primary premise for a lot of this litigation. There's pending cases in other states as well, including one that was just filed in Oklahoma. Um, for products regulated by USDA, there's federal preemption, and so what that means is once USDA establishes a naming framework for those products, those requirements will preempt any state laws that aren't identical. And so once that's settled by USDA, if and when if and when that's settled through rulemaking, that will be a really strong argument that states can't require something different. On the FDA side, there's not that same preemption. And so what that means is ultimately states can potentially impose requirements that are different to what FDA requires. I just briefly wanted to give this example. This isn't... Um, this is a plant-based product, and so it says cultured, I realized after I put the image up, but it's cultured butter, like <laughs> cultured butter, not, um, not using it in, in, in a different way. Um, but this was a, a butter product that was made solely of plant-based ingredients, and it was labeled like this. And the state of California um, went after the, this company and said, you can't sell this product. You can't use the word butter to sell it. You also can't use some of the other claims you're making. There were a number of claims about like no hormones and sustainable claims and other claims like that. And so the company fought back and said, we think this label is entirely transparent to consumers. It says it's made from plants literally right below the word butter. <laughs> it says vegan. Um, it has other claims to make clear that this is not butter as traditionally defined. And they were successful in challenging the state. And so they, they obtained an injunction that, in, that stopped the state from being able to prosecute them. And so I just wanted to give this as an example of where we've seen that litigation play out and where some of those arguments have been successful in a, a very specific basis. And there what the court said was there was no evidence of consumers being deceived by a label like this with some qualifying language. All right, so we're gonna turn to some global developments. We'll talk about nomenclature as well in the context of global developments, but um, just to run down this list, um, Singapore, of course, we know that's the country that greenlit um, cultivated meat product uh, back in December 2020. They have recently uh, published novel foods guidance covering cultivated meat um, just in September 2020, and I think that's pretty instructive just broadly um, for anyone doing an analysis of these technologies um, in other jurisdictions as well. Um, for China, they're pretty early on still. Um, they're still exploring research and development for this, uh, these types of products. Uh, Japan is developing standards uh, to directly permit the sale of cultivated meat. And the EU, uh, you definitely have to go through the novel foods requirements that are in place there. So it's a much longer process. Um, so from the SFA's new guidance, I thought this was a really interesting um, flow chart of the thought process when you're doing your analysis for the inputs. Um, and I think a lot of it can be applied um, even when you're looking in the United States as well, um, including approaches such as the threshold of toxicological concern to certain substances that might be used as inputs um, in media and so forth. Um, so I thought that, you know, if you haven't taken a look, this is definitely online on the SFA website. It's a novel foods guidance published on September 26th of this year. Um, and then the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations um, has had some activity this year in this space. They had a stakeholder roundtable meeting in Tel Aviv back in September, and then they just published a couple of documents in the past couple of weeks in advance of an expert consultation taking place starting on Tuesday in Singapore. And um, the document on terminologies is really important. Um, it talks about you know, the different uh, ways in which we can you know, refer to this product, um, to the, the products of cell culture technology. At a recent online meeting that FAO had, I think they settled on cell base, which is in contrast to cultivated meat, which is the terminology that I understand GFI um, in Asia and the 
coalition in Asia for cultivated meat companies um, agreed on is an MOU online. If you go to the GFI uh, website, you'll find the, the press release about that MOU where they said that all of the companies, most of the companies in the Asia Pacific region will have agreed to use that term going forward um, for this um, category of products. There are two other documents, the generic production process, and then the regulatory frameworks is like a pretty interesting document too. So I think both documents two and three, um, you should take a look at those um, for more information. Uh, generic production process, um, you know, there's this common aspects to how every company is going to go about doing the, uh, their evaluations. And I think that that document is a good starting point for the evaluations here. Um, and then the regulatory frameworks just kind of shows you where the different, uh, countries fall in terms of um, how advanced or not they are with regard to applying uh, their existing authorities to the novel technology that this is. So looking ahead to wrap up, we can expect further clarification from the FDA and USDA regarding the regulatory approach, including that draft pre-market guidance from FDA in the short term. Um, we can look for new USDA rules on labeling for cultivated meat products and poultry products under their purview. Um, but it's a longer term action and we likely will see an important point to make is that USDA has said that they would approve labeling for individual companies before they actually went ahead and published a final version of the rule. So this is not going to prohibit a product from coming to market that's USDA regulated. Um, it's just that the final rules um, are not going to be ready for a while, it appears. Um, and then we probably will see a lot of continued political interest, especially as you know companies near approval in the United States and other parts of the world. Um, and there could be litigation along the lines of the points that Jessica made regarding naming. We wouldn't be lawyers if we didn't put litigation on the list. <laughs> um, and so just some thought leadership we've done over the years, including from our colleague, Dipti Kulkarni, who is a part of our team in our DC office. Um, noted here, um, if you want to take a look. And then um, it's just sums up, sums up our practice. So we're happy to take questions. I feel like we probably went over time. Sorry. OK, cool. <laughs> We'll also be around right after this, too. I think there's a break, so. Looks like we're going to have some questions at the mic, but while you're getting over there, Jessica and Brian, I'll just ask you, I know that you're not going to say that when we are going to have cultivated meat being approved in the U.S., but if you were betting, would you bet yes or no by the CMS 2023, presuming it's exactly 12 months from now, do you think that we will have some type of approval? If you were flipping a coin here. Yes. 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 Yeah. All right. You'd bet, you'd bet in favor of it. OK. Brian? You can hold me to it. Are you going to disagree with Jessica, or are you going to agree with her better? <laughs> we're on the same page, so. OK. OK. I think uh, great talk. I'm Daisy from New Age Eats. I'm coming from a biopharma background. I was in biopharma for 10 years in cell culture, but now I'm in this space. So I'm curious about the conversations you're having with the FDA, and I'm assuming like on the people level, they're bringing people from CBER, like the people who were doing maybe like cell culture stuff. Do you have a sense of, are they bringing their like biopharma hats in, in the sense of like the rigor that they put on us for drugs development in cell culture? Or are they like starting with a clean slate and really looking to us for guidance? I mean, I would say I think it's some combination of both. I mean, I think FDA, you know, the centers take a lot of pride in kind of their own space and what they have oversight over. But at the same time, this is all very new for CIFSAN. And, and a lot of these are kind of issues or things that CIFSAN hasn't looked at before. And so I think we certainly understand that they're consulting with CBER. But I think in the end of the day, FDA is going to have to figure out how to, to take that biopharma framework and modify it into the food space where the expectations just aren't the same. Um, and I think that's a task that CIFSAN will probably take on primarily. I, I think they are probably looking for guidance from, I mean, or input from industry. And I think some of it will be product and process specific as well. Um, but we do know that you know, there's been some cross center collaboration within FDA, which is, I mean, what I would expect. Um, it's a kind of a general answer. <laughs> no, that helps a yeah. lot of things. And just sort of a follow-up is, what are the optics around like the industry informing the FDA? We're like, don't worry about it. It's fine. We can use this stuff. It's safe. <laughs> and we're telling you like what's or telling the FDA what's okay and what's not. 
I mean, ultimately, FDA is going to have to reach that own their own conclusion on that. But I think you know, OFAS, which is the office at SIFSAN who does these pre-market consultations, is um, I think one of my favorite offices at FDA because I think they are very collaborative and willing to, to engage and take input. And so, um, I mean, it, it, it's useful, I think, to give them that input in a way where they can ultimately reach their own conclusions. Mm -hmm. And thinking about the fact that they're looking at a lot of these things de novo, right? I mean, even if they've talked to a number of companies, there might be a certain change in technology or a different input or otherwise that they haven't seen before. And so it's better to to arm them with useful information, I think, and kind of try to guide the direction where you think it should go. Um, and ultimately, I think that office would see that as, as useful. Great, thanks so much. So summary generally with ICLE, we're a provider of uh, engineering and architectural services for both life science and, uh, and the cell ag industry. So follow on question to Daisy's with regards specifically to CGMPs. Do you see that the regulatory environment or the FDA is leaning more towards the pharma, maintaining kind of the pharma CGMPs for manufacturing facilities? Or do you see that they have an open mind to um, to maybe lessen those um, those requirements. I can start, but you can finish. I mean, FDA's authority is to apply the the requirements that are their food requirements. Uh -huh. So they don't have the authority to bring in other manufacturing requirements. But if you've sat down and looked at Part 117 in particular, mm -hmm. some of those requirements are very vague, right, right. and very general. Right. They talk about preventing contamination from all sources. They talk about identifying hazards and implementing controls. And so, I mean, FDA has to stick to that framework. They can't go outside that framework, but there's certainly room for interpretation within that. Um, and so I think that's kind of the, the thing to think about, is to really sit down and look at what does FDA have the authority even to require in the first instance, and go back to, to that and then kind of move from there. And then thinking about, and what does that authority mean? It's to prevent food from being adulterated. And the adulteration analysis is different in the food context than it is in like the injectable pharma context, right? In the, in the production of a sterile drug, it's just very different. So that's, that's how I've thought about it. I mean, I don't know that I, I know an answer, but I think that's how FDA should approach it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's the way the standards of the industry have kind of adopted the CGMPs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so it's, uh, it's interesting to, to see in the cell ag process how, how those standards, industry standards are going are to get formulated and how the FDA regulations get interpreted. Yeah, I think that, I mean, different food categories are produced very differently. Right, the same for way. sure, right. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Poe Bronson from IndieBio. Uh, I'd love to talk about the genetics of the cells and how that impacts the scrutiny here a little bit. So from an investor's point of view, we care a lot about uh, whether one might be using primary cells or simple immortalization or have filed IP and have other work on the engineering of the cells to make them make all this work. I guess my question is, how does the FDA look at that primarily from a safety perspective, but also as it goes to uh, labeling perspectives? Is it conceivable that we would see different naming nomenclature based on what my, may or may not have been done to the cells? Yeah, I can get it started. Um, so in terms of the labeling, uh, the key rule that you have to keep in mind is a national bioengineered food disclosure standard. That standard applies to certain, to most foods, but not all foods. So it depends on what the finished product is. Um, and then you have to determine whether or not there is detectable amounts of bioengineered uh, material as that uh, term is defined in the, in the law. Um, um, the other question that you asked about uh, the safety review uh, when you have these modifications is a question that, that has arisen quite a bit uh, across many companies. And it's, very, it's highly fact specific, right? Um, certainly, um, you can apply genetic modifications in your process to media inputs, to cells, et cetera. But you have to demonstrate that the final product is safe. So it doesn't mean that there's necessarily like an added layer um, of review or, or scrutiny that FDA would necessarily have, but it's just part of like your evaluation of demonstrating safety in the buckets that I mentioned for the pre-market review. 
And the only thing I'll touch on on the naming, aside from the, the Bioengineered Disclosure Act, which USDA you know, oversees and implements, I mean, FDA could consider whether genetic modification is something that's a material fact that consumers need to know about. They have considered that in the case of genetically engineered salmon uh, and concluded that it's not. And so there's some nice analysis in, in FDA's guidance on the, na that, on the naming of genetically engineered salmon that talks about when FDA considers that information to be material to a consumer and when it doesn't. So I think that's a helpful, aside from the USDA requirement, I think that's a really helpful discussion. And I mean, it seems that FDA is generally inclined not to consider that to be material. Um, so so first for the salmon, they yeah. did not require that qualifying information to be provided. And so by and large, I would maybe surmise that the specifics of those genetics aren't really the issue. It's still fun in my about making it safe and that kind of thing, but it could be something that was- Exactly, I yeah. think that's right, yeah. Thank you.